There wasn't vain the warmer welcome if the travel ver and wide. The cousin have a better comrade than a butty by your side. For the forest seven on earth, every man to know his worth. Singing obis the old butty and obis gwine on. Obis gwine on, obis gwine on. Singing obis the old butty and obis gwine on. The Forest of Dean. Heaven on earth, as Keith Morgan says in his Boris National Anthem. But what is this place really like? And who are these people that enjoy such fanatical praise? Here, between the Severn and the Wye, belonging to neither north nor south, east nor west, yet inexplicably and intangibly savouring of them all, harbouring through the years rebels from all quarters, trading legally or illegally by land or water with all comers, grimly defending their independence from the time they poach the king's deer to the present day as they defend their commoners' rights. They have developed a character, a dialect, and a humour all their own. So too with the forester's thoughts, salted with that sense of humour, mellowed in the balm of long sunny days, yet warily weighed and assessed in the light of their hard and often bitter history. Unpalatable they may be to some, but as you are about to hear, they carry with them not only the full flavour of their practical forest origin, but also a warm and affectionate pride in their past. Of all the milestones in this life, the one I found most cruel is that traumatic, awful day when first we go to school. I still remember how I felt, so full of little fears, yet trying hard to look at ease while forcing back the tears. For all at once, a strange new world was waiting to be known. I turned around, but Mum was gone and I was on my own. A fat girl with a yellow fringe was bawling loud and long. I stood there in my Wellingtons, determined to be strong. Then teacher took my sweaty hand and led me to my seat. Now what's your name, she gently said. I stared down at my feet. My mouth was dry, my stomach churned. I seemed to lose my voice. Then out it came in one long squeak. Please, miss, my name is Joyce. Then all the children sang a song. I felt my spirits rise and everything was somehow changed before my very eyes. Miss drew a picture all in chalk. We played some lovely games. And long before the dinner bell, I'd learnt the children's names. I ate my lunch. Cold toast it was, washed down with cold sweet tea. The fat girl with the yellow fringe was bawling still. Dear me, what babies some girls are, I thought. I'm glad I didn't cry. Well, score's all right, I said to Mum. She smiled. I wonder why. Joyce Latham's poem about starting school will surely strike a familiar chord in many a heart, for most of us recognise our earliest memories, rooted deep in our childhood days. In her books... Our Winifred Foley has written long and lovingly about her upbringing in the Forest of Dean. She believed, and still does, that the plaintive wind in the trees she heard at night as she lay in her childhood bed at Briarley in the heart of the Dean were the sighs of all the people who had died and who wanted to return instead of going to heaven. Let us sample her memories now in Early One Morning. The feather bed, made from chicken feathers by ancestral grannies, was warm and soft. My sister, little brother and I, slept in its dents as cosy as beans in their fur-lined pods. Winter and summer, Mam had quite a job praising us out of it. From our little back bedroom window, it was hard to see what season it was. The bottom of the tiny window rested on the garden level of the cottage above ours, and weeds often obstructed our minute view. On school mornings, our ma'am kept calling up the stairs, threatening us with a stick on our behinds to start out with, and very likely the same from the headmaster at the other end, if we were late for school. 
We became quite expert at measuring the irritation in Mam's voice, and we mostly timed our jumps out of bed just as she started up the stairs. We thought of a good ploy to fool her by banging our boots on the wooden floor without actually leaving the bed, but it didn't always work. On summer mornings, once up, it seemed just as good as being in bed. My sister and I washed first in the little dark back kitchen. Our little brother could take his time. He was too young for a stint of water carrying before breakfast. My sister had a proper yoke with a bucket at each end, and I had two wire-handled tins. Mam would be getting our breakfast, toast done in front of the fire bars and kept warm on the hob whilst we went down the garden path, then through the gently sloping woodland and down to the well at the side of the main road. Converging from other paths, we could hear the voices of other children on the same errand. The pure, exhilarating morning air, the sunshine benediction, and the thought of the warm toast to come, plus our sleep-renewed energies, often drove us mad with joy. In those days, wild, sweet days, we had the privilege to behave like lunatics. We could yell our heads off, take running jumps into the lush green fern between the trees, make drums out of our buckets with banging sticks, and pause to look at all the wonders along the way. Look at this bloody yup under here. The flat upturned stone revealed a mass of sluggish wood lice. Poor stupid things, hiding from the summer's day. Whatever did they do all day? Unlucky creatures. Lower the stone again, very carefully, not to squash them. Oh, how lucky I was, born me instead of a woodlouse. Hey, they come see what I have owned. They can start them. There's plenty of growing here. We picked and relished the pale green, juicy, sharp tanged leaves of something we knew as wood sorrel. It often sharpened our imaginations as well as our taste buds. Coo, I just in a girt great fox over there. We blood round his chops. And we hid behind the tree over there. We knew it wasn't true, but in an ecstasy of terror, we would run screaming down to the well. Fear tightened throats were soon eased with cupped handfuls of sparkling spring water. In the mossy stream from the well overflow, we observed the progress of the black spot in the frog spawn via the tadpole to the endearing, ugly, croaking frog, a fairy prince, of course, under a witch's spell. Water slopped out of our containers as we raced to pluck the rare white foxglove amid the myriads of pinky-purple ones growing among the ferns. These special ones were for teacher. By the time I eaved my tins onto the back kitchen table, the water content was well down. Toast in hand and off up the hill to school. Spring brought the leggy lambs running up to their mothers for short and urgent sucking sessions. We saw the afterbirths. We knew that hens laid eggs, and that baby pigs came out of the mother sow. But we never doubted that we were young, godlike creatures, mysteriously deposited under the gooseberry bush to be brought to our mothers in the midwife's bag. How I scolded Mam on one occasion for just lying in bed all day with our newborn baby when she should have been getting our tea. That she must be there to keep him warm seemed a poor excuse. Autumn brought the fluttering leaves, piled by the winds into banks of confetti to jump and roll in and scatter back to the winds. Winter seeped through our boots, aggravating our itching chillblains, but they were soon forgotten in the snowball parting with our enemies, and icicles made lovely lolly ices to suck. But summer mornings were the best of all. Mornings to recapture, when I listen now to the evocative genius of Beethoven's pastoral symphony, taking me back to the well springs of my childhood, to fetching water from the well. <laughs>
What forester will ever forget those sheep? Here, there, and everywhere, with their lovely sheep dogs, flashing here, disappearing there, ever moving, ever watchful. And the sheep badgers themselves, clad in their thick clothes, yorks at the knee and ankle to protect them from the wet grass and bracken, mysterious, elusive, and invisible when it's suited, carrying on their shoulders complaints from all quarters, but unperturbable and utterly stubborn in defense of their rights. One such man was Warren James, who certainly seems to have been a thorn in the authorities' side, as Keith recalls now. Warren James were sort of mon, as Alison as right was done. All his life him was in fair ply, and feared not any mon nor boy. But Warren, him were up in arms, and set off round woods and farms, gathering all his mates around. Him told him all what him had found. All the land be fenced, him said, where once our ship and pigs was fed. Time a come to make a stand and tight the fences from the land. All our rights will disappear, lest we to stop it now, right here. All agreed to meet Dick Knight, when they had start to put things right. Stroke a twelve, they all met up, ten or twelve, to tidy up. Off they went into the night, each one was spoiling for a fight. Soon I come to trouble spot, and set about to shift the lot. Very soon our work was done, and off they set once more for worm. All the common land died free, where once more their pigs and ship could feed. In the morning, sharp at night, a mon come drew old Warren's gait, rattled hard upon his door, and shook the house from roof to floor. Warren opened up to see what all the noise out back could be. Then him's in the local squire, who'd come to give our friend the wire. Less his tricks him did curtoil, and him would find this off in joy. Warren gathered up his men, and told him plainly thar and then what could happen to em all if thy still went again the law. To em on thy did agree, the sorry business drew thy'd see. Help was needed right away if thy were gwine to win the die. More and more they gathered in, till they had got enough to win. Off then zet the merry band to drag more fences from the land. But these times with our dismay, a bunch of soldiers blocked our way. Mon took off we out of weight, and Warren James him took to flight. When they went to serve the writ, they fought Niden in a pit, took him far a cart of law, and sentenced him before them all. So the sentence for his crime was transportation for all time. All his mates were sad and grave, but from that time no trouble gave. In the end I changed the law, and Warren got a pardon call. But Warren James ne'er came one, and never sit his mates again. But remember to these die, the freedom mon has showed the why. Warren James, the freedom fighter, was transported to Tasmania as punishment for the part he played in the riots of 1831. More than 150 years have passed since then, and yet the subject of commoners' rights remains as contentious as ever. <laughs> Pigs, too. Years ago, every villager's home had a pigsty in the garden, ensuring a constant flitch of bacon on the living room wall, and plenty of lard for crusts of home-baked bread. Some still have them. How those pigs were pampered. Dried bracken harvested from the woods for their beds, household scraps and barley meal to fatten them, and constant cleaning and attention, prized and petted by all the family. But when it came to killing time, a far less sentimental approach was highly desirable, as Joyce remembers only too well in her poem, Bacon Butty. From an iron hook they hung him, upside down, an awesome sight. When a draught so slowly swung him, oh, it gave me such a fright. Draped around his butchered torso lay a weird translucent veil. From his head, which scared me more so, blood dripped down into a pail. In a pan his stomach floated, 
Yards and yards, it seemed to me. When we've cleaned these, Father gloated, I'll have chitlin for my tea. Then a wooden bench scrubbed cleanly served to bear the corpse's weight. And the butcher, no way meanly, chopped him up. Oh, what a fate. Ham and bacon he divided, with saltpetre they were cured. Then, on special hooks provided, to the wall they were secured. Lumps of fat to lard were turning in a pan upon the hob. For those scrutchins I was yearning, crisp and crunchy, just the job. Spare ribs, griskin, lights and liver, pale pink trotters boiled with peas, red blood oozing like a river, made black pudding for our teas. Homemade faggots, so delicious, food galore for many a meal. What a pig, oh so nutritious, nothing wasted but the squeal. Pigs do seem to feature strongly in forest folklore. There's Keith Morgan's tale of Pig on the Wall, for instance. Ziddy and Jummy were sat on a wall. A pig was a mooting close by. When onward came Umpine down the main street, and the folks rushed to watch him march by. Beautiful music, said one bloke to t'other. The best in the forest, Zid said. A nit pig stopped the mooting and cocked up his ear. Then he lifted his girt ugly yard. "'Twere as if the fine music had got through to him "'and had registered deep in his brain. "'I think Dick Pig's fond of some Sousa, said Jim, "'and Dick Pig squealed out as if in pain. "'Him squealed in time to the beat of the band, "'and he danced around there on the ground. "'Twere the funniest thing as they'd ever was in "'for a musical pig they had bound. "'As onward got nearer, the pig jumped up high "'to try to see over the wall. "'But twere to no avail, for Dick wall was quite high. And Nick paid him were not very tall. As the second carnet player played a lovely B flat, Dick Pig him got into a state. Him rolled on the ground with his bit in air, and him looked at Dick Wall vulivate. The trombonist blew out a brilliant quaver, the sort that the village weren't used to. But Dick Pig was beside his soft now as he clawed at Dick Wall between him and old Sousa. Ziddy looked at Jummy, and Jummy at Zid, and both in turn scratched at his hat. Perhaps, said Jummy, it would quieten down if up on these wall him was that. Perhaps he be right, old city replied, as he give the old pig a call. And together thy lifting up in the air, and zatin on top of thick wall. Now when he were sat on the top of thick wall, he were able to see him at last. He sat there content, we is yud in the air, and he watched the old brass band go past. Now, in the old days, the buying and selling of livestock was often conducted at the local pub, of course, and any talk of pigs just wouldn't be complete without Winifred's story of old George Dobbins and the bargain. When old George had a couple of coppers to spare, he toddled down to the pub at the bottom of the village, there to reflect on the vocabulary glory of his peers. He loved to pick up what he considered smart sayings to pepper his own limited conversation. When the two Will's cousins was arguing about the selling and buying price of a young pig, George was all ears. Three pound I'd want for this pig, and it's worth every penny on it. Two pound ten I'll give thee, and it's worth a grunt more. Three pounds. Two pound ten. Three pounds. Two pound ten. Three pounds. Two pound ten. And on and on. Tell thee what, then. I'll split the difference. Give I two pound fifteen. Done. Two half pints is either, missus, and charge him to the shy lock, demanded the seller. Split the difference. Split the difference. The saying sounded very grand in old George's ears. One evening, sometimes later, he went into the pub with a dead cock while he had fattened up in the coop. It was a fine, fat bird. I'll give thee one a six for the cunt, offered one of the men. I'll give thee one a nine for him, said another. I'll make it two bob. And the offers went on mounting up until the grand sum of half a crown waited for the hammer of George's fist. Blue eyes a twinkle with his own importance, chewing hard on his cud of tobacco, rubbing the grey stubble on his chin with the effort of getting his punchline in the right order round his tongue. Old George kept the last bit of waiting. Looking round his eager audience and saving his moments of drama, he brought his fist down hard enough to spill drops of cider from the glasses of the more parsimonious drinkers. Then George got it out. Split the difference, he boomed. 
give I one and dripples. Our daddy was a collier until that sly black dust squeezed out his very breath and made his lungs feel fit to bust. Then, of course, there were the mines, the main industry then. Now all the large mines are gone. Only the indomitable free miners remain, and not many of them. How glad and proud of their pits those men were, the lucky ones living near their pits, others walking two or three miles to the pit head before facing up to a couple of miles underground to the coal face. A hard day's work in hard conditions before facing the long trudge back. Some to go sheep badging, some to their large gardens, some to their rugby, cricket or band practice, and many to the pubs. How committed they were. Committed to their jobs, there wasn't anything else, to their mates, as their mates were to them, in mutual trust for mutual safety, and to their homes, and their comrades in work and play. It must have been hard to watch these giants of men, being slowly sapped of their strength by the miner's curse. Joyce remembers our dad. Our dad was a collier, until that sly black dust squeezed out his very breath and made his lungs feel fit to bust. He paid a heavy price for work, as did his butties, too. And those who managed to escape the miner's curse were few. Some days his chest was not so bad, and then he'd tell us tales about his life when he was young and working down in Wales. Or he would sing a sad old song, which always made me cry, because in the end some mother's son would always have to die. But he would make me laugh as well with jokes and funny rhymes. Yes, Looking back, I realised that these were happy times. Who knew these men better than Dr Tandy? Dr Tandy, highly trained in England, for years in charge of a hospital in India, then for 40 years GP and surgeon to our forest folk. During those 40 years, he became our beloved Bill Tandy. He knew the joys and the commitments. Catherine was 18. She was an attractive girl who had been brought up by her aunt. Her father died just before she was born. He had been badly gassed in World War I. A few years later, he developed pneumonia. His damaged lungs could put up no resistance. There were no antibiotics in those days. He died without seeing his baby daughter. Kathleen's mother received no war widow's pension. The Treasury did her out of that. She struggled to bring up her child, denying herself. When Kathleen was five years old, her mother developed pulmonary tuberculosis. Consumption, they called it then. It killed her in a few months. She had a married sister, twelve years older than herself, who was only too pleased to adopt Kathleen. She had no children of her own. Her husband was a minor. She was a kindly woman, an ardent Baptist. She had been strict in bringing up her niece. I was very surprised when Kathleen came to see me one surgery and said, I want you to tell me, doctor, if I'm pregnant. I looked at her and she smiled at me. She was not at all upset. I thought of her aunt and what she would say if Kathleen had an illegitimate baby. I should have thought that Kathleen would have been very distraught at the prospect, but no, she sat there quite composed and smiled at me. When was your last normal period, I asked her. Last week, she replied. Then you're not pregnant, I told her. But I could be, she said. You see, Tom and I tried last night. We very much wanted to happen. Well, I said, come back in three or four months' time, if your periods stop, and I will tell you then. But I want to know now, she said. It's impossible to tell you now. But I want to know now, she said. I leant back in my chair and looked at her. Now, Kathleen, perhaps you will tell me what this is all about, I said to her. 
Well, said Kathleen, you know Tom? Yes, I replied, I know Tom. I had seen them about together. Tom Barnes was a young miner, a year or two older than Kathleen. He was a decent, steady, straightforward chap. Tom and I want to get married, continued Kathleen. We're very fond of each other. But Auntie won't hear of it. She says I am too young. So we thought that if I got pregnant, she would have to let us get married. So we tried last night, and now I want to know if we managed it. I couldn't see any reason myself why they should not get married if they wanted to. I rather sympathise with Kathleen's bit of blackmail. It was her naivete I found so surprising. Come back in three months, you have had no periods, I told her. You will just have to be patient until then. Kathleen came back in three months. She was pregnant. There was now the ordeal of breaking the news to Auntie. She, with Tom, who had been sitting patiently in the waiting room, went straight away to face Auntie. Auntie couldn't get them married quickly enough. She had a Baptist friend to think of. They were a nice young couple, very much in love with each other. They found a cottage to live in, not much of a place, but a home, and it was not too near to Auntie. They settled down to await the baby's arrival. Forty weeks after Kathleen's visit to the surgery, the baby was born. Auntie was thrilled. She thought it was a most beautiful baby. She didn't seem to bother very much that her Baptist friends were counting on their fingers the number of months that had passed since the white wedding at the chapel. It is wonderful what the sight of a baby will do. Tom was thrilled with his daughter. When he got back from his shift, he would take off his dirty mining clothes, get into the tub of hot water that Kathleen had got ready for him, and she would scrub his back. When every speck of coal dust had been removed from his body, he got out of the tub and draped himself in a towel. He then went over to the cot, gently lifted the baby out, and held her in his arms with a look of rapture on his face. It was one of those wretched, wet November days, some months later, when the trees are bare and the dead leaves lie brown and sodden on the ground, that my phone rang at tea time. The manager at one of the local pits was on the other end. There's been a roof fall, Doctor. We think we'll need you. Can you come along? It really was a depressing sort of day. The rain was a persistent wet drizzle. Patches of mist were hanging about as I drove to the pit. I got out of the car and went to the pit head. They're just bringing him up now, Doctor, the manager said. I listened to the whine from the engine that was winding up the cage. It stopped at last, and the iron doors of the cage clanged open. Four black-faced, grim-looking miners, wearing their helmets, carried out a stretcher. They stopped when they saw me. One of them, a deputy, said, I don't think there's anything you can do, Doctor. I stooped down and drew back the blanket. He was quite right. There was nothing I could do for Tom. But there was just one thing I did have to do, one unpleasant thing. It was to go along and tell Kathleen that Tom would not be needing his hot tub that day, or ever again. It was a horrid job. Not the only time I had that sort of a job to do. In 1946, the National Coal Board took over the Forest of Dean Collieries. One at a time, they closed them all down. The last one to close was the Northern United on Christmas Day, 1965. The coal board decided that the pits were uneconomic. In terms of the economics of human life and happiness, the board was right. And what will you do now, old Bert, since they have closed the pit? It was the only job you knew. Your life was spent in it. It's hard to try and start afresh when you are past your prime, and all your working hours were spent down there amidst the grime. How many days you've missed the sun and God's air clean and pure while you were working underground, fresh hardships to endure. This cheerful fire we gather round was chipped from earth's dark womb, and many were the victims claimed by that same dusty tomb. But now the wheels were turned no more, the miner's work is done. They did a job. They did it well. God bless them, every one.
Ailments of all sorts were only too common in the old days, and it wasn't just the ones you got at work. When folks had to cope with cramped cold houses, British winters, and poor diets, it wasn't too long before they went down with something or other. Though many trusted in their doctor's powers of healing, there were also many folk who concocted their own cures, many most effective, some weird and wonderful, but all cherished and respected. Take Ellen Blow tea, for instance. The Ellen Blow's a lovely flower, a froth of creamy lace, and yet when someone mentions it, I always pull a face. My thoughts fly back to childhood days when Dad would take his stick and pull the blossom-laden boughs down low, the blooms to pick. Then when he filled his old straw frail, he'd straw back home again to spill his treasures on the sill behind the window pane. The blossoms soon were brown and dry. They crumbled at a touch and filled the room with strange perfume. I didn't like it much. But when old winter came around, the first sign of a cold, and out would come the Ellen Blow, more dear to mum than gold. She'd put it in a china jug with sprigs of black mint, too, then pour some boiling water on and leave it all to brew. When I was tucked up warm in bed, she'd get the biggest cup and fill it with the horrid stuff. I had to drink it up. Through gritted teeth, I forced it down for fear that mum would scold. But worst of all, when morning came, I drank the rest stone cold. And I wonder how many remember Senna mixture. It certainly sorted out all George's problem, as Winifred well remembers. Normally, simple old George was as placid and untemperamental as the sheep lying under the trees in the surrounding forest chewing their cud. After a few days of uncharacteristic grumpiness from the old man, one of his pit butters asked, What's the matter, old un? See you been getting out the wrong side of the bed lately? One worthy who could have been a born medico in more affluent conditions hit the nail on the head with his diagnosis of George's trouble. How oh, long is it since he's been to the manor, old buddy? The manor was a natural hole in the forest, well hidden with surrounding undergrowth where the men went for nature's cause and left the bucket privets in the gardens for the use of women and children. George rubbed the stubble on his chin and shook a negative head until inquiries had gone back a week. That's the trouble with the old un. They was bunged up. I reckon a lump of thy old woman's bread pudding that got stuck and can't go up or down. They'd fill up with gas like the cows do. They'll go to the doctor's tonight and tell them they was constipated. Like most simple souls, George was apt to do what he was told. That evening, he turned his muffler clean his side out and walked the two miles to the doctor's surgery. And what is it that's troubling you, Mr. Dobbins? I be constipated, sir. I see. When did you last pass anything? On the road here, sir. And what was it like? Austin Kyart, sir. A bottle of senna mixture and a few sprints to the mono, and old George was chewing his twister back again as contented as the sheep. He outlived the doctor, and when he was in his nineties, the doctor's successor, by now an elderly man himself, humorously suggested to the old man that the only way he could send him on his way was to shoot him. Then again, there are the so-called magical cures. Bill remembers a splendid character called Henry, who, amongst other things, told him of the wonderful healing powers to be found at St. Anthony's Well down at Green Bottom. Henry, an odd job man, lived in Upper Redbrook, transporting himself from job to job on a bicycle. He was fond of rough cider, a bottle of which always accompanied him on his bicycle rounds. Like so many people who live alone, he liked nothing better than talking to anyone patient enough to listen. He it was who told me that Swan Pool, between Cherry Orchard and Upper Redbrook, was haunted. If you pass the pool at midnight, he said, you would hear the sound of a child crying and then see the figure of a woman with a child in her arms emerge slowly from the water draped in green, slimy waterweed. Then a large black hound comes out of the woods nearby, gallops around the pool, then disappears into the woods again. Henry did not always live in Upper Redbrook. He had spent his childhood the other side of the Forest of Dean, near Little Dean, at a place called Greenbottom. 
He told me that when he was a boy, he and his pals used to wander about in the forests nearby. They met gypsies there and watched the charcoal burners that frequented the area. They played near St. Anthony's Well, which is not a wishing well, but has healing properties, with the reputation for healing which went back many centuries. To drink the water was good for rheumatism. To bathe in it cured skin diseases. Henry, grinning, told me that he and the other boys used to increase the potency of the healing powers of the water. How did you manage to do that? I asked him. <laughs> we used to pee in it, he replied. And finally, for all troubled souls, Joyce reminds us of the most potent, most blessed cure of all, nature's cure. The perfume of another summer's day comes floating on the breeze as if to say, just for a while enjoy my fragrant flowers and seek the solace of my leafy bowers. For peace of mind, discover nature's cure, away from crowds, the traffic's angry roar, deep, deep in forest green to lightly tread, where emerald moss has made a velvet bed. The distant tinkle of a far-off stream enhances the illusion of a dream. Tall foxgloves with cool grasses interlace, pink sentinels of this enchanted place. The waiting silence steals into your mind and troubled thoughts and fears are left behind. A deep, forgotten peace invades your soul to prove that nature's cure can make you whole. There be nothing like good ale. There be nothing like good ale. They can skip the tea and coffee, because there be nothing like good ale. They can sup the pint and blind a bit and argue all night long. They can laugh and shout and stamp the vet, and they can sing a song. For when these be through, we all are that, and quietly we your pint be at. They's got to nod the yard and say that there be nothing like good ale. There be nothing like good ale. Good drink of whatever kind, with good companionship, what comfort they have brought to us all over the years, and they invariably go together, often abused, often overdone, yet far too often the only comfort left in a lifelong search for happiness. Variety seems to have been the keynote, and each man had his favourite. Cider, perry, ale or wine, homemade brew or bought, the end result was much the same, of course. But there was one concoction that you could buy around here back in the 1930s that was literally lethal. It saw off a number of poor chaps one way or t'other, until in the end it was banned by the local bench. Stunham it was called, and a highly appropriate name it was too. George was fond of Stunham, a filthy evil brew, and didn't care a tinker's cuss about the damage it would do. Him guzzled it in him regular, twere his windy light. Ten pints every morning and another ten at night. It made him feel quite happy, as quietly him did zit, losing all inhibitions and the use of both his vit. His body felt quite peaceful, but from the waist down him were jud. No sense of feeling in his legs and not much in his yud. Jarge had had a skinful, his guzzling it were done, and there and then decided him had better yud for one. Him put his empty mug down and looked towards the door, and got up from the table and collapsed upon the floor. His mates they went to Alton and got into his vit, and inquired of him with some concern, George, cause walk a bit. Him took a short step forward and drew girt biggins back, then spun around and hit the wall and gave both shins a crack. I took him to the doorway and facing up the hill, and told him to go steady or him would have a spell. Him thanked them all for helping, and waved them all good die, and staggered out into the road and set off a t'other why. His pace it did get faster as he lurched between the trees, leaning at an angle about a forty-five degrees. He met a girt big oak tree with a loud resounding smack, and spun around and shook his yud, then started his way back. He began to feel quite drowsy, the result of all his booze, and thought he'd get his yud down and have himself a snooze. He lay down in the roadway, in the curb he put his feet, with a cat's eye for a pillar, and his jacket for a sheet. Meanwhile a buzz was coming, taking the night shift home to bed, and vast I was approaching where old George was peacefully led. 
when thy sin him in thy yudlites, thy stop dick buzz real quick, and went across to Jarge to see if him were jud or sick. Jarge was snoring like a good un. We a really contented smile. Twere as well as he was happy, cause he be there a while. The bloke strolled round the boatin, thy had a proper fright. But when thy sniffed the evening air, thy understood old Jarge's plight. When them blokes had all decided, the dear old Jarge hadn't died, thy liftin up between em and puttin in the zide. Thy climbed back on thar buzz, and drove off home to bed, and left old Jarge a snoozin on his tarmacadam bed. When Jarge woke up next morning, the sun was shining bright. His shirt and socks was wringing wet from the dew that fell that night. He got up from the curbside, and stretched and had a think, and pondered which he needed most, his breakfast or a drink. He looked up towards his cottage, and down towards pub door. Then, taking a firm decision, George strode down to have some more. Now it seems appropriate at this point for Bill to introduce you to Arthur Jones. In 1911, Lloyd George introduced the National Insurance Act. It provided manual workers with free medical attention. Thirty years had gone by since Lloyd George's Act, yet Arthur Jones, an elderly forester, a miner who lived alone, could not rid himself of the idea that there was charity associated with it. Charity was something he could not accept. Each time he came to see me, he would bring a small gift as payment to show that he would not accept something for nothing. He would bring a couple of cooking apples or some pears, sometimes a few eggs. Arthur was in his late seventies. He still worked at the coal face. When I felt his pulse, it was irregular and bumpy. The radial artery felt hard and beaded from impregnated chalk. I advised him a number of times that he should give up work. I bain't able to, he would reply. I be saving up for me old age. He came into the surgery one day, bringing an old lemonade bottle with a dirty label on it which contained a turbid red liquid. He put it on my desk. I picked it up and looked at it, then looked up at him. How long have you been passing blood in your water, Arthur? I asked him. A pained and shocked expression spread across his face. That be my special homemade blackberry wine, he informed me. I never got round to sampling his wine. When I picked up the bottle, something seemed to deter me from pouring any out to taste. Soon afterwards, Arthur was found dead in bed, having died in his sleep. He'd been at work the day before, still saving up for his old age. As I said, variety is the keynote. And with a bite of something to eat, <laughs> what bliss. So how about some supper at the local? A big red spotted anky, half a loaf of bread, a lump of double Gloucester, onions big as your head, a quarter to a zider, supper for a mon. Zack we all your butties when all your work be done. But mishaps can and do occur. Winifred remembers one such occasion. Facts are facts and have to be faced. And in truth, when I was a little girl, next to my dad, I loved my belly. It was a tyrant, always sending messages up for anything I could scrounge for it. I was a good scrounger, from old great aunties bacon rinds and crusts, too hard for toothless gums to chew, to the bits of corn I could peck up, before Miss Phillips' foe was gobbled them when she threw a couple of anthers to them over a garden gate. Best of all, my stomach and I mutually agreed with suet treacle poured, and Granny was our greatest benefactor in this respect. Granny's bevy of daughters were all away in domestic service or married, only her son remained at home, but Granny never made suet poured for just the three of them. She waited until she could get enough ingredients for her household, our household, and any other children within sniffing distance. Pudding claws were her problem. Clean white rag was hard to come by, and there were so many other uses for it. 
Baby's bums, for instance, and there was plenty of them about. Granny's problem was solved on one occasion when one of her daughters brought home from service a couple of white cotton tennis stockings given her by her mistress. Just the job, thought Granny. Granny mixed her puddings in her used bread crock, then stuffed them by the yard down the stockings. She filled her cup with water and lit the fire underneath it. When she finished her washing, it was Granny's habit to rinse the cup out with clean water and dry it. Something must have distracted her on the previous wash day, for a residue gel of Hudson's powder and soap had been left in the bottom. Now Granny's copper was in the darkest end of her dark little back kitchen. Unaware of the soap when the copper came to the bio, the clothes of steam hid the frothy water, and Granny couldn't smell it. She had lost her sense of smell from a severe sinus illness years before. The puddings bubbled about like a bunch of anemic Loch Ness monsters. We children and our friends stayed near at hand, playing upscots on the piece of our trodden earth outside our garden gate, waiting, waiting for Granny's cause. At last, come on in, me butties, bring some of you to put your pudding on. We lined up with our saucers, etc., by our back kitchen door, taking our turn by our sorting slab for a dollop of pudding and ration of warm treacle. Then we perched in rows on the stone steps leading from her garden down to her tiny courtyard, just in case a second alpin might be forthcoming. A second alpin? Who we could hardly down the first. Something had gone amiss. The pudding tasted bitter and soapy. We were no gourmets, and the anticipation had been so great. Besides, we were well-mannered enough to hide our disappointment from our beloved granny. We controlled our grimaces of distaste and swallowed every mouthful. Granny always left herself to last, but there was some in the toe of one of the stockings for her. Life hadn't made granny a gourmet either, but she pulled a very wry face with her first spoonful. Then, realising what she had done, she said, Lord a mercy, this puddin' be awful. Oh, my God, I hope I am poisoned a lot on ya. Oh, well, if I have, I might as well poison myself, too. And she ate hers all up as well. The stomach spasms didn't hit us all at once, but it was frequently one in and one to go, doubled up outside the garden bucket privy. However black the clouds gathered on Granny's horizon, she always poked in them for a bit of silver lining. She found some then. I tell thee what, she observed to ma'am, so you'd need to give her many doses of brimstone and treacle for a bit. I reckon all their insides have had a good clean out. A couple of years later, Granny moved to another part of the forest. We missed her even more than her treacle puddings. To Granny's eyes, the world was an infinitely richer place. Now, on a more serious note, the subject of tainted food puts me in mind of the old market at Mitchell Dean. Many years ago, Eli Hatton was hung on a hill overlooking the village. It is said that, well, let's ask Keith to take up the story. Thy young Eli Hatton on Pingery Tump. Thy young him for murder, thy side. And the curse that Eli be stole on Nick Town remains there to these very die. Thy young him in summer time, saw thy the sigh, unrepentant and vil of eight, gibbeted he was on the top of a hill, a savage and terrible fate. The sunlight shone bright as I strung Eli up, and flooded the hilltop with light, and for miles around everybody could see old Eli in his sorry plight. A far meeting his maker, him lifted his yud, and shouted these curse loud and clear, A curse on you people, your market and town, I swear for these deed thou pay dear. We that him grew quiet and passed on his way. His cursing and shouting were done. Him hung there quite peaceful the rest of the day, 
at rest in the warm evening sun. He mung there four days in the warm summer sun. Round his vit the children did play, till the temperature got a bit out of hand, and Eli did start to decay. In the town down below the market was full, the farmers are selling their wares, prime beef, pork and mutton for which I was famed, ducks, rabbits and cockerels and hares. The people who travel for miles around to purchase this prime own grown meat, some fifty or sixty had walked into town, ignoring the strength zapping eat. Meanwhile on the hillside, old Eli had guests, attracted no doubt by the smell. About six million houseflies was milling around, and varty blue bottles as well. Thy sons in off Eli, and then flew around to plan out the rest of our die. Tis then that thy noticed it market below, and decided that's where thy'd die. Thy flew off together and set off downhill, and fell from the sky like a cloud. Thy buzz round it market from one end to t'other, var settling down on the crowd. In no time at all, thick market was bare. No butchers, no people, no meat. No trading, no profit, no business, no hope. Just blue bottles, house flies, and eat. Folks never went back to the market again. Business got progressively worse. And townsfolk would glance at the top of the hill and damn Eli Atten's loud curse. Thy young Eli Atten on Pingery Tump. Thy young him for murder, thy sigh. But the curse that Eli bestowed on the town remains art of these very die. Yes, the forester can do without pests, all right, whether they be insects or the humankind. But they do like their pets. And pets invariably find their owners, if they're foresters, that is, a bit of a soft touch. Now take Ernie and Joyce's tortoise, for example. Now some folk, they like grip big dogs, while others favor cats. I've known a few as mess with birds, and others keen on rats. There's gerbils, rabbits, guinea pigs, most every kind of pet, and pretty little hamsters too. They all be nice, and yet, take Joyce and Ern from Drybrook. They got a dog, thou snow. They thought about a tortoise, cause they fancied some at slow. Well, they'd been told as tortoises on racing weren't so keen. To satisfy this sudden urge, they searched around the dean. At last they found a dozian, and then they brought him one. Joyce giddin' yet the lettuce leaves to fill his little tum. Him toddled round their nice front lawn as happy as could be, and feeling well content with life, they went and had their tea. An hour went by, then Ernie said, See how him's getting on. But when Joyce had a look for him, her found as him were gone. Now where the devil can a beer pondered in a state? They turned it garden upside down. By now it was getting late. Their collie dog they scrutinized from top of yud to heels. In case him thought as tortoises were them their meals on wheels. Then suddenly a neighbor popped his yud above the fence. Be this thing thine, him said to him. Thou use their common sense. Now, how did him get over there? Oh, it be ours, all right. They shoved him in a girt big box, all cosy for the night. Come, morning, him are gone again. Joyce snivelled at his face, and then they spied the varmint. Him were halfway through the gate. So Ernie built a little fence to keep the tortoise in. Him can't get out of that old butt, said Ernie with a grin. But I'll be dowd, him must sprout wings, cause once more him were gone. By this time, poor old Joyce and Ern were feeling put upon. Dick thence thy flanked with girt big stuns, likewise some hefty bricks. The last I heard, Dick tortoise him are still up to his tricks. So should a tortoise pass you while you're driving your Rolls Royce, it's safe to bet that superjet belongs to Ern and Joyce. Billy were a short ass, just five foot off the ground, and Billy was a bandsman, the best bass drum around.
Billy were a short ass, just five foot off the ground. And Billy was a bandsman, the best bass drum around. Silver Prize was marching, but this guy was the best. We Billy right behind him, his bass drum on his chest. Thick drum were big as Billy, and strapped upon his chest, poor Billy had no inkling of the whereabouts of the rest. Strike roads was no problem, him just kept going on. But crossroads was a yuddick for thick par drummer mon. Soon they reached the junction. Decision time had come. Left went Silver Prize, and right went Billy and his drum. Silver Prize was flummoxed. Dar leader called, Vol out! They looked up back for drummer, but Bill was not about. Billy kept on gwine, thumping for all his might. Left, right, left, right, marching on, off into the night. Off o'er hill and valley, o'er moor and mountain crest, wondering when the shout had come to stop and have a rest. Thy never found poor Billy, though rumours flew quite thick. Someone had seen him drumming a ten miles north of Wick. If thou see a band's one, a marching wee a drum, turtin' round and toitin' back, the way back to his wum. Yes, the Forest of Dean has been and still is the home of many excellent bands. Out in their smart uniform, with their gleaming instruments and their highly trained skills on display, they were the envy of many a young chap. As well as the never-ending rivalry between village bands in the forest itself, even greater success could be achieved by entering regional or even national competition. This gave the ordinary forester a chance to see something of the world at large, though, judging by their reaction to it, <laughs> they weren't always impressed by what they saw. Tom Phipps was one such man, as Bill explains. Tom Phipps was a forest miner who lived in Pillowell, a village of straggling cottages on a steep hill. He was about 45 years old when I first met him. His wife was a couple of years or so younger. Tom was an expert cornet player, a member of a local band. It was a very good band and had recently entered a national band competition, reaching and winning the semi-finals. The final contest was held in London. The furthest Tom had ever been from the Forest of Dean was Gloucester. A visit to London was quite an adventure for him. I met him soon after he returned. He was disappointed that his band had not won the competition. I told him that I thought the band had done very well to be the runners-up. He was not to be comforted, and was very critical of London, a daft place full of daft people, he commented. He related how he had gone into a lion's corner house for a meal. A young woman come up to me and says, what they have? Two cackles on a grunt, I says. Do you know, Doctor, I didn't know what it meant. I did not confess that I also was ignorant as to what two cackles on a grunt were. Later I discovered that it meant two eggs and bacon. While travelling on a London bus, a young woman wearing a rather short skirt had got in and sat opposite to him. Every time I looked her way, I pulled at her skirt to keep her knees covered. Fair got on my nerves, it did. So I leant across her and said, Don't mind me, lass. Cider be my hobby. I didn't half glare at me.
It was about ten o'clock one November night when I got a telephone call to go and see Thomas Oliver. He lived up a very narrow lane off the road that leads from Christchurch to Simajat Rock at Ready Penny. When I got the message I groaned inwardly. Not only was Thomas Oliver a bit of a cantankerous old man at times, but it was a very foggy night. As I drove nearer to Ready Penny, the fog became really dense. I had difficulty in finding the narrow lane along which Thomas Oliver lived. By then the visibility was about a yard. Eventually I located it. Carrying my bag in one hand and a torch in the other, I groped my way up the lane. The torch was useless and merely threw a white beam a few feet into the darkness. I was beginning to think that I would not be able to find the house, the fog was so thick. Then I saw a faint light shining dimly round the margins of a shut door. At last, I thought. I found the garden gate eventually by brushing my hand along a hedge until I felt it. I opened the gate and went along a path in the direction of the light shining around the closed door. I arrived at the door and knocked. There was no response. I knocked again, more loudly. After about a minute, the door opened an inch, and a voice said, What do you want? I've come to see Mr. Oliver, I replied. In bind ear, said the voice, and the door was closed, and I heard a bolt being drawn. After my struggles to get to the house, I found this reception more than just disconcerting. I banged loudly on the door. It opened again about an inch. I've come to see Mr. Oliver, I repeated. In bind ear, I'm telling you, said the voice, and shut the door again, and I could again hear the bolt being drawn. My temper was more than a little frayed by this time. I hammered hard on the door. When it opened, again for about an inch, I said, If Mr. Oliver isn't in, is Mrs. Oliver in? Er, bain't in, was the reply. Nobody bain't here but me. Look here, I said, I'm the doctor. I've been sent for to see Mr. Oliver. I've come all the way in this fog to see him. Why can't I come in? What's going on in this house? House, said the voice. This ain't house. House be up garden path. This here's the privy. Yes, indeed. Gardens were multifunctional in those days, with privies and wells abounding, as well as the vegetable patch, the flowers and the fruit. And how the forester loved his garden. It had a pretty high priority, I can tell you. Even as a boy, I spent many hours tending to my father's couch fire with wet turfs to ensure that it didn't burn through. (laughs) But now then, when it comes to bonfires, there's no one can touch old Albert. Old Albert loved his garden. It were his pride and joy. He had loved it from the time when he were just a little boy. And every Easter Friday, off to his shed he'd go to get his vark and shovel his dibbler and his owl. Him had got a good half oiker to a tidy bit, and digging and owing did kip old Albert bit. Him troubled not if it were wet or even freezing cold, for though he now were seventy three, him were like a two year old. Him loved to dig his garden, him loved to pull up weeds, him loved to spread manure, him loved to plant his seeds, him loved to old potatoes, of this he'd never tire, but best of all he really loved a stinking girt gutch fire. He set to work a riking and gathering rubbish up, and when he'd finished riking, him had got a tidy up. Cutch grass, ducks and nettles, cabbage stumps and all. In a girt big yup, he riked them up again the wall. Him stood back to admire it and have himself a fag, then strolled up to the garden shed to fetch an oily rag. Then returning to his garden yup, he placed the rag inside, then struck a match and lit the rag and some grass as him had dried. Dickie began a smoking, just a bit at rust, then suddenly the yup broke up, and out a black cloud bust. A black cloud full of zut and smut, and a stinking awful smell, that brought a smile to Albert's face, for him were going well. Very soon the street were black, as though night had come, bit soon. Puzzled neighbours looked aloft to try to see the moon. Sheets and blankets washed thick dye, and hung to dry out back. Sparkling white dar billowing, suddenly turned black. The neighbours shut their windows to try to keep it back, but the filthy, stinking odour went through the smallest crack. Old people choked and spluttered, and little babies cried. The swallows went back wum again, and dogs ran off to hide. Die out or die, Al piled it on to keep the blighter going. 
and we arrived contented smile would go back to his owing, unaware that all around was panic, grief and suffering, as Albert's pile of stinking muck slowly went on smouldering. By the third wick it had quietened, and the smoke was not so thick, and the houses weren't so dirty, and the neighbours not so zick. And Albert's ground was planted, we his seeds up through the ground, as he lie back in his deck chair, peace at last he found. He lie there in his deck chair, reflecting on his pile, and reckon to his self as it were best done by a mile. A dree wicker him had managed for the first time in his life, despite losing all his neighbours, his whippet, and his wife. Water was often a problem for the house and the garden. Not all villages had council water supplies, not all had wells. Often water had to be carried long distances from public wells or even streams if the water was known to be clean. Joyce remembers what it was like to be a human water carrier. When someone came to our house, the first thing Mum would do would be to put the kettle on and make her favourite brew. She used to have a ritual. It was a sacred thing, one for the pot and one all round with water from the spring. We didn't have a council tap. We had to fetch it all from way down in the wood each day, and I can still recall how Dad would wear a wooden yoke, with buckets, one each side, while I would take a large white jack to carry, full of pride. It was pleasant when the sun shone bright, but when the snow lay deep, with frozen hands I envied friends all warm in bed, asleep. But tea like our mum used to make, with water from the well, I know I've never tasted since. I guess I never shall. I leave the last word on the subject of gardens to Bill, who now recalls his memories of Canon Wyndham Jones, the vicar at Christchurch for many years. The vicarage garden was obviously high on his list of priorities too. Canon Wyndham Jones, vicar of Christchurch, could be seen some years back outside the village school at the junction where the five roads meet as the children came out of school. He stood in the middle of the road, tall, elderly and distinguished looking, wearing a long cassock and with a red beret on his head. He was acting as a self-appointed traffic warden, protecting the children as they crossed the road after coming out of school before the days of the lollipop man. I met him one day as he was walking from the Simmons Yat Rock direction towards Christchurch. I stopped the car and offered him a lift. He thanked me and opening the door on the passenger side, put one foot inside. Then he hesitated and said, Have you ever driven me before? No, vicar, I answered. Crossing himself, he muttered, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, just to be on the safe side, Doctor. During one Sunday service, he announced, Next Sunday is Harvest Thanksgiving Sunday. The good Lord will be pleased to receive in the church the products of your labours in the shape of fruit, vegetables, and flowers. The good Lord will also be grateful for a load of horse manure, but he does not think it suitable for it to be placed in his church, so if he can be put in the vicarage garden, I will deal with it for him. He was a much-loved man, simple-hearted, delighting in humour, and loving humanity. I had a call to a house in Christchurch one morning. I knocked on the door, which was opened by a young woman, with tears pouring down her cheeks. I'm sorry to be so upset, Doctor, she said, but I've just heard that Canon Wyndham Jones died in his sleep last night. So Canon Wyndham Jones finally received his call or cue. In his poem, Time and I, Will Harvey reminds us that one day we shall all get our final call to leave this beautiful place for the last time. Time has tugged my teeth away, thinned my hair and turned it grey, killed my friends and will kill me, yet time is not my enemy. Time on his appointed way goeth as I on mine today, goeth onward with a sigh, grumbling maybe, as do I, goeth maybe glad of heart to have been and seen a part of this world's proud pageantry. Time's an actor, just like me. Wondering, waiting his last cue, exit, just like I and you, as theatre lights go out, 
what the play was all about. When I was a young married woman of 26 and visiting my parents, Granny walked through the woods the two and a half miles to us for a quat and a chat. When it was time for her to go, I walked most of the way back with her. We stopped for a breather in a little valley with steep wooded sides. It was so peaceful and beautiful there. A sparkling little stream meandered through beds of watercress. Birds sweetly twittered in the branches over our heads. The dappled sunshine through the trees gave a perfect mixture of warmth and shade, and the moss-covered earth was soft beneath our feet. Granny stood there for some minutes, quietly gazing round. Then she sighed. Ah, my wench, I mustn't grumble. The Almighty have been good to me, for me let me go past me three score years and ten, and the time be coming soon for me to go. But, oh, my wench, I shall miss all this. Now I have got old, dear Granny, and I know just how you felt.'